In the previous video, we explained the very appealing properties that competitive equilibrium has. That even though the consumer doesn't know anything about the firms, and even though the firms don't know anything about the consumers, that if you're at the equilibrium price P star, then the selfish actions of the firm, just taking P star as given and maximizing profit, and the selfish utility maximizing actions of the consumer, just taking the price of corn as being given and maximizing utility, together generate a supply of corn on the one hand and a demand for corn on the other hand that's exactly equal to each other. So you don't need to coordinate anything. That's the magic of P star. The consumer just has to care about himself, not about anybody else, and certainly not the firms. The firms just have to care about themselves, not about any other firms, not about the consumers. They just uh, blindly maximize their own objective function, whether it's profit or utility. And these individuals acting in a completely uncoordinated way generate quantity demand that equals quantity supplied in market equilibrium. So that's really nice. Now, every economics textbook, in uh, at least that teaches principles or intermediate micro in the United States that, that I'm aware of, goes on to explain how you get to equilibrium using the following kind of story. Suppose that you're not at P star. Suppose that you're at some price that's above the equilibrium price. Well, then there's excess quantity supplied, because quantity supplied is here and quantity demanded is here. And so there's too much stuff supplied. Uh, inventory is building up on store shelves, so firms decide to lower the price so they can get rid of the stuff, and that puts a downward pressure on price. Similarly, suppose you were at a below P star price then quantity demanded is here and quantity supplied is here so you have excess quantity demanded so consumers go to the stores they don't find as much stuff as they want so they bid the price up and so you get a a, a price going up a, a f economic forces that make the price go up if the price starts out being below p star and the price go down if the price starts out being above p star and in this kind of way, you converge to the competitive equilibrium price of P star. And the point I want to make is that as a theory of competitive equilibrium, so I wrote that here, that's the theory that we're working on, this story is fundamentally flawed. Now, let's recall where the demand curves and supply curves came from. We had a theory behind the supply curve. It's a theory that's illustrated on the left-hand diagram, and it's a theory of a competitive firm that takes prices as given and therefore thinks that the demand curve is horizontal. Now think about where the market demand curve came from. It came from the right-hand side, the theory of the consumer, who is a price-taking consumer, and so he thinks the supply curve is flat. Uh, let's suppose that the price is actually P1, which is above P star. And then the story is that you have excess supply. And that the firms see inventory building up. They can't sell everything they want to produce, and therefore they lower the price. How does that translate into the left-hand diagram, which is the firm behavior? It doesn't translate at all. In our theory of the firm, we never said the firm decides to produce QF and then he finds he can't sell it and therefore he decides to reduce the price down to something like this. Okay, that was not... Uh, let me draw that a little bit better. That was not in our theory of the firm at all. Our theory of the firm had a fixed price and the firm reacting to that and deciding on an optimal quantity. End of story. So telling this new story about well if the price is P1 then the firm decides to reduce the price 
in order to sell more stuff that it can't get rid of is completely inconsistent with the, the theory behind where the supply curve came from. Now, I'm not saying that that might not happen in the real world, but what I'm saying is if you've got a theory where there are inventories and the firms are moving price around, that is not going to give you this supply curve. That's going to give you some other kind of supply curve. This supply curve came, the theory of competi came from the theory of a perfectly competitive firm. And you got to stick with that. You can't uh, draw this supply curve and then say, oh, well, suppose the firm isn't competitive and then pretend that the supply curve stays where it is. It, it wouldn't be. In fact, it would generate a completely different theory of the supply curve. Okay, how about what, have, what are the prices down at P2? Well, then the story is consumers can't find as much as they want and so they bid the price up. But that's inconsistent with the theory that gave us the, the market demand curve. That theory is shown in the right-hand diagram. In the right-hand diagram, the consumer took the prices given. That gave a flat supply curve. Then he decided what was the best quantity to, to buy. There were no situations where the consumer decided to say, I mean, where the consumer having decided where he wanted to go, then discovered, oh, you actually can't buy this much X because there's not enough in the store. So you should you should bid up the price of X so you can buy some, which means increasing the price of X just means the consumer decides to twist his budget constraint in this direction, that is, increasing the price of X. Okay, and again, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen in the real world, but that is not the theory that generated this demand curve. And I, I believe it was uh, Joan Robinson, I've written, her, I typed her name on the upper left, I believe it was Joan Robinson who first pointed this out, at least uh, I came to this realization after having read one of Joan Robinson's books. She is a um, British uh, mid and late 20th century economist uh, who basically said you can't you you can't draw the demand curve and draw the supply curve assuming competitive equilibrium and then throw out the assumption of competitive equilibrium but keep the same demand and supply curve. So the well, the correct and the correct analysis is the following. The theory of competitive equilibrium tells us what happens at P star. And lots of wonderful things happen at P star. It doesn't tell us anything at all about how to get into competitive equilibrium. There is no theory about how to get into a competitive equilibrium. If you're at P1 or, or P2 and you're assuming competitive firms, there's no way to get to P star. But P1 and P2 aren't, you can't actually be at P1 and P2 forever because you have this disequilibrium, quantity supplied is an equal quantity demanded. Um, well, I don't know, maybe you could be in it uh, always with the uh, uh, well, well, uh, at least with at, at P2, you could always have excess demand, I suppose. Uh, consumers would always be frustrated, but uh, everything that was produced would be sold. You couldn't be at P1 because you just have an infinitely accumulating buildup of commodities. The, the, the point is that there is no theory of how you get into equilibrium. Now, this has been in some sense known for a long time, uh, Leon Walras, the famous neoclassical economist from the late 19th century, uh, came up with a fiction called the Walrasian Auctioneer, somebody who, um, a fictitious person who conducts fictitious auctions in non-historical time, not real time, so that he can figure out what P star and Q star are. But that's a completely artificial story that doesn't have anything to do with the real world. Now, there are certainly economic theories about getting into equilibrium. Uh, one is called tetonment. But um, again, I, 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 I think they're just simply inconsistent with the fundamental principles that you use to generate the competitive demand curves and supply curves in the first place.
So I'm not going to discuss any further these ideas of a dynamic approach to equilibrium. If you're in equilibrium, great. If you're not, we don't have a theory about how to get there. Let me point out, finally, this is not simply something that is an issue with intermediate microeconomics. It's an issue with all kinds of notion of economic equilibrium. It even is a problem when you talk about, let's say, the equilibrium in dynamic games, uh, which is a very sophisticated concept, but there is no theory of how you get into such an equilibrium. That's a fundamental difficulty with the notion of competition, and it survives even in much more complicated frameworks than this one.